they exerted their rights over the land and they made the people living here their tenants. Today, again in Ireland, unlike England, Scotland and Wales, we have no landlords. They left us again. <laughs> now, when Dan O'Hara lived here, this house would be regarded as an elaborate house for a tenant farmer in this immediate area. There was card games played here. Visiting took place. There was dances here. Indeed, we have two recorded marriages that stemmed from meetings in this little cottage. So really, ladies and gentlemen, you're standing and sitting in the 1840 uh, ballroom of romance in this immediate place. <laughs> <laughs> then in 1845, Dan O'Hara increased the size of his windows. He put glass on them. For that, the landlord doubled his rent. This was well known at the time throughout those islands as the windows tax. The Irish, again, cleverly enough, did not call it windows tax. They gave it a new name in the Irish language. That name was translated into English, and it's used very widely today in the English-speaking world. The terminology, daylight robbery. <laughs> That's where that terminology came from. The Irish called it daylight robbery. Now, when he failed to pay this exorbitant rent, this little house then became the scene of an eviction. A typical eviction that time was the landlord arrived with the heavily armed police. The family was put outside the door, the roof was set on fire, and some of the walls were pushed in. That was a typical eviction in the west of Ireland during that period. And in fact, between 1845 and 1852, 65,000 families were evicted from their homes in this fashion in the west of Ireland and forced across the sea to America and Canada. Half of them died on the ships going there. Those ships are well known today as the ill-famed coffin ships. It took between 8 and 12 weeks to allow sail ships. No fresh food, no fresh water. Children were very vulnerable. Anybody that died at sea was buried at sea. Dan O'Hara then left here in 1845 and he sailed for New York. Again, the same story. His wife died on the journey and three of his children died. When he arrived in America, he wouldn't have much, if any, knowledge of the English language. The people living here were speaking in their native tongue. The four remaining children were fostered out to different families in New York, and Dan O'Hara ended up on the streets of New York selling matches. He died within a few years, but he became a legend, well known today in song and story. And like a lot of the Irish stories, they were put into songs. You hear a song about a place and about a family, and then you can come and visit that place, and the song is accurate. There's five verses to the Dan O'Hara song. And not only is it telling the story of Dan O'Hara, it's replicating 65,000 stories. If you take one verse from the song, it would say, But the landlord came, you know, and he laid my old home low. My poor old wife and I were sadly parted. We were scattered far and wide, and my children starved and died. So it's here I am today, a broken hearted. I cush le gal McCree, the blessing of my heart on you. I cush le gal McCree, won't you buy a box from me? And you'll have the prayers of Dan from Connemara. I'll sell them cheap and low, buy a box before you go. From the broken heart is harder than no And O'Hara's matches. 1847, then, would have saw greater devastation in Ireland. The potato crop failed. Now, the potato crop failed because of a blight fungus. Today, we call it the famine. But in truth, there never was a famine in Ireland. 
You get famines in Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, because of long droughts. But anybody that's in Ireland for a few days, no, we don't get long droughts here. The Green Isle, everything grew. So in 1847, we had plenty of beef, meat, grain, wheat, butter, cheese, fish, bacon and so forth. That was being exported out of the country by the landlords on a continuous basis. The people were made depend on the potato. When the potato crop failed in 1847, the export trade was allowed to continue. 1.2 million people died of starvation in this country in 1847. Another million was forced to cross the sea that year to America and Canada. Half them died on the ships going there. The population of Ireland in 1847 recorded eight and a half million. Wow. A few years later, the population of Ireland was reduced to below four million. And just remember that time we were part of and within the richest empire in the world. And that then along with immigration ever since is one of the reasons why today surveys carried out five years ago indicates 50 million claiming Irish descent in the United States. 5-0, 50 million. That is the single largest ethnic grouping. The second largest are thereabouts, close enough, are the Germans. Now that's changing rapidly because by the year 2030, 2040, the white man will be a minority in America. We talked then about a few recent presidents being of Irish descent. We talk about Ronald Reagan, Ballyboreen Tipperary, John Kennedy, Wexford, Ford, a great Cork name, Henry Ford's father, William Ford, sold the little farm in West Cork, moved the family to Detroit, and the son started making Ford cars. Jimmy Carter, Longford Westmead, Bill Clinton, northwest of Ireland. But in actual fact, surveys carried out in America indicates that 23 out of the 44 American presidents, their ancestors came from little cottages like this in Ireland. Of all the United States presidents, and half them were Irish descent, without a shadow of a doubt, the best man ever for Ireland was Bill Clinton. The peace process in Northern Ireland would not have seen the light of day had not Clinton been in the White House at that time. Worked tirelessly with Tony Blair to put a solid peace process in place in Northern Ireland. We had another thing going for us that time as well, Tony Blair. His mother was born in Ballyshannon in County Donegal. So Tony Blair's mother was Irish. He worked tirelessly with Clinton, the Irish government, and the parties in the north. And I would have to say they have put a solid peace process together in Northern Ireland. Peace with justice, parity of esteem, and equal opportunities for everybody. And that could only move on. There is now a political way forward. And it is time to put the bomb and the bullet aside. Now Clinton was here as well four times while he was president. He's been here 25 or 30 times since. And now he's bought a house here. So no other president of the United States so far showed as much commitment to the home of his ancestors as Clinton. Now when the people lived here and they were totally self-sufficient, they also made their own whiskey. The old Irish whiskey was known as Ishgabaha. Ishgabaha means the water of life. Ishka, say Ishka, Ishka. Whiskey. whiskey. So that's where the word whiskey came from. Whiskey is an Irish word, Ishka, whiskey, whiskey. Uh, whiskey means nothing in any language, but only in the Irish language, Ishka, the water of life. 